Well, we've been on our series, Battlefield of the Mind. And we know the real battle is takes place between our ears and our head, doesn't it? We've titled the series, Stinking Thinking. Stinking thinking is thinking that's wrong thinking. It's irrational, illogical, unhealthy, <coughs> deluded, deceptive type thinking. So thinking that we've been doing all of our life and we, if we're going to correct that thinking, we have to think about what we're thinking about, don't we? Be intentional. Learn to recognize when we're in that bad neighborhood, when that thinking is wrong, irrational, illogical. Catch ourselves uh, and to learn to recognize that thinking and do something different and develop good, healthy, good, strong thinking. We have to begin to bring thoughts captive and renew the mind and to learn how to tear down strongholds. The passage we've been on is 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. Verse 3 and 4 says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. They're not physical weapons of flesh and blood. But they're divinely powerful. Amplified says, Amplify says, They're mighty before God for the destruction of fortress or the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Now these weapons of warfare, some of them are located in Ephesians 10 or 6, 10 through 18. We've said that these weapons are divinely powerful, they're spiritual weapons. It's not all inclusive, but one of the main ones is prayer, and I like to add fasting to it. Reading large quantities of scripture in the word, knowing the truth, what God says, so that you're ready for the lies. Holding up our shield of faith with which we will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the enemy. And I like to put in their worship. There's nothing the devil hates more than for us to worship, give glory to God, and that just sends the devil running every single time. You, know, you want to you wanna kick the devil's butt, wake up in the morning uh, singing songs and hymns and praises to the Lord. And instead of focusing on the negative, focus on the positive. So these weapons are powerful for the destruction of fortresses. That's our word stronghold. Destruction means to overthrow or to pull down or tear down. Disarm, dismantle, uproot these strongholds. Strongholds are fortresses. The word is ancient. It means ancient means they've been there a long time. It depicts a fort or a castle or a citadel that is well fortified. High walls, it's well protected, well organized, well established, armed, it's it's dug in, it's entrenched with an attitude of permanent warfare. That means it, you know, they they've decided they're they're gonna be there till death do us part. They're not going anywhere. They're dug in, they're entrenched with a with a permanent attitude that uh, you know there's uh, we're not going anywhere. Our definition is strongholds is deeply ingrained habit patterns or thinking processes, or the ways we've been doing business all our life. We've, they're, they're called strongholds because they've had a strong hold on us because we've been doing it since perhaps we were kids. And over a period of time, we've practiced these habits over and over again. These unresolved issues in our life, these character defects have gone deeper and deeper, deeper down into the root system and they've got a deep, deep, strong hold on our lives. They control, dictate our behavior, our thoughts, how we view life, how we view God, how we view ourselves. And they uh, dictate our behavior, you know. And you can hate them, not like them. You can't wish them away. But you can have these tools that God has given us to, to pray, pray, begin to pray them away and to Renew with the mind and to worship and, and apply these principles and begin to tear these things down and replace the bad strongholds with the good strongholds. So we said that first John first John one nine says that if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, you know, these strongholds start out as seeds. They get into the ground. They begin to manifest themselves. They get below the surface. They have a deep root system. Eventually these strongholds begin to produce bad fruit. So you've got bad strongholds where you develop bad roots that continue to place to produce bad fruit. If you don't like your behavior, you don't like the things that are going on, then you've got to trace it down. You've got to identify these different roots that are causing the fruit. And if we will confess our sin, if we will confess that these strongholds are our responsibility, that they're sin, if we come into agreement and say what God says about these, that they're wrong, they're not okay, I have no right to hang on to them, they need to go. And if we will ask God to forgive us for these sins, that means if we'll identify the fruit, specifically confess those sins, and it says He is faithful and just to forgive us, for their sins, and he's also says he will cleanse us. <coughs> Cleansing is more than forgiveness. We've said if we recognize behavior and we repent of the behavior, we don't get down to the root, then it's just going to reproduce itself, isn't it? So we've got to get down into this root system. So yeah, we confess and we we uh, ask God to forgive us, but what we've really got to do is get down into what's causing why I do what I do. Why does this habit and practice continue to serve us in my life? Where did it come from? Where did it start? And this is where we've been given the tools. Uh, we talked about last week. How many uh, got the handouts from last week? Did anybody not get the handouts from last week? You raise your hand real high if you did. Real high. And you can see Damien and there's a couple there that uh, they can get them to you after or during the meeting. But those basically are renewing the mind. Identifying the strongholds, journaling, journaling, confession, and then prayer and fasting. And we gave you uh, several tools, sheets, gave you uh, a daily moral inventory on the fruits of strongholds, some prayers. On how to deal with these some some so some of these things will be very very helpful. Now Second Corinthians three through six. Let's go back there again. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. The divinely powerful for the destruction of forces and strongholds. And then he goes on in verse 5. This is what we're going to hit on tonight. It says, We are <coughs> destroying speculations and every lofty thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next week we're going to take this further and start talking about bringing thoughts captive. This, this is uh, going to be one of my favorite one of my favorite uh, teachings next week so you don't want to miss this. Uh, one version says in as much as we are refuting arguments, theories, and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself against the true knowledge of God the Passion Translation is a, is a real help. I love this. It says we are we, can de we are demolishing deceptive fantasies that oppose God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance against the true knowledge of God. So we're going to break this down tonight. This is going to be a teaching tonight. It's not a preaching. It's going to be a lot of information. I'm going to give you a lot of rich Greek kind of stuff because uh, you know, just reading through this like I did all my life, it wasn't until I started digging in and studying it and looking at the words and what they mean, it just brought out all new uh, revelation, enlightenment into what this is. 
And so the first thing it says here, so we're going to talk about speculations and lofty things tonight. Basically, there are two more strongholds, but they're sneaky ones, ones that you'd never recognize until you study them and you go, oh, okay, that's how that works. And this is why it's so important to, to know your Greek. You don't have to be a Greek scholar or go to college to be able to look up certain words and do some basic word studies. It's exciting. These two strongholds are going to be called lofty things and speculations. Deeply ingrained habit patterns and thinking processes. So Paul says we are. Circle that. We are. He's talking to his people and he says I am and you are. He's assuming that this is a practice or a habit or a discipline that's going on in the church. You know, apparently they already he had already taught on speculations and lofty things. Or they knew about it. And he says we are. So that's we are means it's present tense and, and the word is progressing. That means it's it's uh, something that is happening right now and continues to happen and is progressing. Progressing that means it's lifelong. It's a habit and practice, a discipline that you're going to have to do all your life. So Paul says we are engaged in destroying. This word destroy is the, is the word kather. It comes from the same family of Greek words on the destruction. We just talked about the destruction of fortresses, the dismantling, disabling, and disarming of, and uprooting of the stronghold. So uh, he says that we are destroying these strongholds and fortresses and we are also destroying lofty things and speculations. Destroying is the word demolishing. It comes from kind of the word demolition. We all know what that word is, right? A building has been there forever. It's out of code. It's not worth fixing up. So the city makes a decision to condemn it. And they send in a demolition crew with a wrecking ball. And they just knock down this old, ancient building, this thing, structure that's been in place. And they just, instead of trying to fix it, they just take it out. Tear it all down. Blow it up. Whatever. You've seen how they do that. It's also the word for dethrone. Kind of refers to a king that's been a king a long time. He's dug in. He's been there forever. He's been reelected every year. He ain't gone nowhere. And all of a sudden, somebody, somebody, you get a new dog in the fight. And he's got a challenge. And for whatever reason, he's able to upsurp or dethrone. Take this person out of authority. So you're out of here and I'm in here and, and this person takes over now. So we are demolishing these lofty things and speculations. We are dethroning them and overthrowing them. That means to relieve of authority. These strongholds have had authority in our life. Been there forever. They're dug in. It also is the word for take captive. Next week we're going to be talking about taking thoughts captive. We'll get more into it next week, but basically taking thoughts captive refers to how we handle a thought that is unhealthy thought. I mean, we talk about the thought turns into uh, you know, an attitude and then a behavior and blah, blah, blah. So we have to catch the thought really up front before it does. And we have to take it captive. It means to take it as a prisoner. What the word really means is, Greek means it mean, refers to a Roman soldier that sneaks into the enemy's camp. He picks out a certain target, catches them while they're asleep, he puts his foot on their neck, takes it, the point of a spear and threshes it into uh, his throat so that it pins him to the ground and he can't move. And he strips him of all of his armor his weapons, puts cuffs on him, arrests him, and takes him by the point of the spear and leads him uh, into captivity in, from one place into another, from a bad place into their care, their control. 
This is what we have to do with the thoughts. It's the word for refuting arguments, theories, and reasonings. To refute something means to prove that a statement or a theory is false. It means to disprove or make it wrong, to discredit or to destroy the credibility or discount someone's testimony. I mean, you know, the devil is always out to discredit the work of Christ. And that's what these strongholds are doing. They're, you know, they're, they're taking away our authority. They're discrediting us. us. They're on the throne. And so we are demolishing these things. We're demolishing them. We're tearing them down. We're dethroning them, overthrowing them, taking them captive. And we're refuting all the different arguments that they want to make again. Whatever. I don't care about any of that. This is what's, we're taking charge. They've been in charge. Now we're going to take charge. They've been dictating, now we're going to take it. We're going to demolish these things. Paul says, we are. So he's just saying this is, this is something that is a way of life. Uh, it's not going to just go away. But you can recognize it, demolish these things, and now you can replace it. Instead of being the, 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 the tail of that, you can be the head. Instead of being below, you can be above. You can master. You can dictate. You can be in control. You can rule. You can have dominion. We are destroying these lofty things, speculations that are raised up against the true knowledge of God. The word raised up means to set oneself against or to be in opposition to or opposed. I mean, you know, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to who? The word opposed is actually a military term. When we have pride, because God hates pride, what it really means is that God is opposed to that prideful attitude. It's contrary to Him. So when it says that God is opposed, what it really means, it's, it's, the, the word means to put on military, warlike uh, armor and to rage in battle against something. That means your posture has been meek and timid and shy or whatever. Now you're so angry, you're so upset. You are so, what's going on is so contrary to what you want to have happen. It contradicts, it's challenging, it's fighting against you. It's so opposed to you that you get so mad. Finally you say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to get into the cage. I'm putting on the gloves. I'm putting on my military war. I'm getting my spear ready and... And I'm, I'm getting angry. I'm getting upset, and I'm, I'm going to go. Oppose, I'm going to go head to head with you in battle, with the same dug in and trench intensity that strongholds are. So it's it's a combat word. So we're demolishing these things and anything. So the devil, uh, the devil is the father of lies, isn't he? Yes. yes. He knows that if we ever know the truth. John 8 32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth will do what? Set you, set you free. So, if we've been lied to, the way we deal with the lie, we find out the truth. And He doesn't want us to know that truth. That's why He's the Father of lies. Not just the liar, but the Father of it. He's the Master. And He knows that if we ever find about the true knowledge of God, who God really is, and we come to know God intimately and experientially, uh, and we find out that the true revelation of who God really is, then then, then he's been had. He's been exposed. And, and how many know half the battle is knowing who your enemy is? So all this, these strongholds and things, we've been doing it. We, we have no idea the devil's behind us. We just think we're, we're, we're a mess. And we are a mess. But the culprit, the person who's behind all these things is the devil who is opposed to the things of God. He hates the things like He doesn't want you to find out the true knowledge of who God really is. So the word means raised up against means in defiance and rebellion to the message, I like, I like the, the message here. It says that we are smashing warped philosophies and tearing down barriers that are erected that keep people and prevent people and hinder people from entering into a full knowledge and a full revelation and having confidence and assurance about who God really is. And so these strongholds of Lofty things and speculations are strongholds that are deeply ingrained habit patterns that the devil has been behind that he's used that, that are keeping us 
from being able to find out who God really is. And so if we really want to know who God is and we want to enter into a deeper level of intimacy, we've got to be able to dismantle and tear down these strongholds and replace them with good strongholds. So Paul says this is what we're doing. We're, we're going to war on these things. We're demolishing. We're tearing down these lofty things, these speculations, these deceptive fantasies, these arrogant attitudes. And we're taking thoughts captive to the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is what we're going to talk about next week. Alright, so the first thing we want to, the first one we want to take a look at, I don't know if you can read this or not, but it's, the first one we're going to talk about is lofty things. Your board's about had it. First one we're going to take a look at is lofty things. The word is soma. Means to be lifted up, refers to a prideful and arrogant attitude. We know attitudes are spirits that are working, aren't they? So lofty things are prideful, arrogant, exalted. The word means to be high opinion or to have an elevated opinion, inordinate view of yourself. Have you ever seen anybody like that? <laughs> Have you ever been like that? We all do. Two of the biggest strongholds are pride and fear. Two of the big ones. But the word, the word, you know, 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore let he who stands take heed lest he fall. Paul is saying, let that person that is prideful, arrogant, lifted up, has an elevated opinion, let that, that person that thinks they've arrived. How many, you know, have you ever seen somebody that thinks they know it all? Kids say, oh, you're a know-it-all, you're a know-it-all, you're a know-it-all. It means you can't receive instruction. There's no humility. You think you've learned it all. You're not teachable. And when a person feels like they've arrived and they've got it all, it says, he says, take heed because you're getting ready to fall on your butt, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Pride comes before fall, before relapse. So anytime we've got this lofty, arrogant, kind of high-minded attitude, uh, it's a stronghold that's going to keep us falling and falling. That pride. We talked to some in church about Peter's pride. We don't know all the details, but apparently Jesus has been very patient with the leader of the disciples, Peter, but he had a lot of pride. And finally, he just said, look, Peter, you say this, you say this. I see you arguing with the disciples, but I'm here to tell you before the night's over, before the rooster crows three times, you, you, you're quiet, you're going to deny me three times. And you're going to be sifted to get rid of that pride. So Jesus knew that stronghold of pride that was in Peter had to be eliminated, had to be dealt with, or he would never, he would come back at the root system, that deeply ingrained have pattern of being having lofty thinking, that high minded he, he thought he was, I'll die for you, I'll go here, I'll do this. He was tooting his horn, he was writing checks with his mouth and his rear end couldn't cash. Is that what we say? Jesus knew it had to go, it had to be dealt with, and had to be replaced with some humility. So he let him fall on his butt and he said, but I pray for you. I pray for you that when you got egg on your face and you fail, that you'll turn and you'll repent. So what, what, what Jesus was doing, he was loving Peter, but he recognized an area that was, that was going to be a stronghold and he had to deal with it. So the word means to treat with contempt. The word it means to be on a high horse. My mom used to say, son, you're getting too big for your britches. Her way of saying, you know, you think you're all that. Treat with contempt says you, 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 you literally have a stronghold that's so deep that you really see yourself up here. I mean, you really think that that's where you are. You see yourself riding on a horse and you see everybody else way down here. And you really think that. That's how deep the stronghold it is. It's not, it's not something, well, uh, 
I know it's not really true, but I'm going to make them think, no, this treat some of the is arriving at this place of stronghold where you really believe uh, that you're that much better than everybody else and everybody else is down here and you're looking at them like, wow. Well, y'all really need to pay attention to Pastor Dave tonight. He's got some good stuff going right now and you're seeing it as everybody else but yourself. We know the giant treated David with disdain or contempt. He looked down on him and said, oh, you're nothing but an old uh, nobody. Now the second one is what I call speculations on Bislos. Well, it's L-O-G-I-S-M-O-S. L-O-G. That was my fault. Sure. Anyway, it's where we get our word logical or logical. One word for it is vain imaginations. 1 Corinthians 10, 5 we read says we are refuting arguments, theories, and reasonings, and deceptive fantasies. That's what we're talking about here, speculations. So the first aspect of speculation, and this this is this just this just so hammered me. I'll just be honest with you right now. I mean, I've all we've all done with lofty things and you know, I know where that's gotten me and what, what it can do, so I'm always having to be aware of that one. But this speculation, I had no clue until I really stepped. I go, oh my gosh, that's me. That's got me all over. And so, whether you get anything out of it tonight, I got a lot out of it. Okay, so hopefully you will too. This word speculation, it refers to reasonings or false reasonings. When we contemplate, calculate, consider, and deliberate without the Lord involved, then it becomes false reasonings. False reasonings are reasonings that are wrong. They're warped philosophies. They're arguments, but they're terrible arguments. They hold no weight. You can argue, 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 but there's no there's no, uh, there's nothing to your argument. They're illogical, irrational, and unreasonable. How many of you remember Star Trek? Spock would always say that's illogical. He always, and everything had to be make sense with him. What he was basically saying, well, what what you just said makes no sense. There's no. Whatever, and there's no argument. There's no there's no healthy reasoning in your processing and the way you're thinking. It's a, it's it's out to lunch. There's no rhyme or reason, no rationale. It's unsound and unhealthy type thinking. How many of you have ever been irrational in a lot? Or have you ever seen somebody that's just totally irrational and and you go, man, you know this guy's just out to lunch. It's the word deceptive. We know when the devil first went to Eve after God had already said who they were, created in His image and His likeness. The devil got in Eve's ear and it says that He beguiled her. Has God really said? The word beguile means to confuse her. The intent was to deceive her. And so what he did is he got into her head with lies and he, he got her in question. He got her to question God and says, Has God really is that what God really meant? When God reasoned and he said what he said, was that really what he meant? Is that what he said? Was that really what he meant? And it says all of a sudden she got beguiled. That means she got confused. She got deceived. She got deluded. So this word means to be deceived or to be polluted, corrupted, or tainted, twisted, perverted in your thinking. Have you ever heard somebody say, I've said it before, it's my best thinking got me here. You know? I remember God telling me when I was dumping one day when I had that religious spirit and all those things on me, and he says, you know, if you're really all that, then what in the world are you doing 38 years old in a swamp in Okeechobee, Florida? You're really all that, ain't you? 
really stung me and humbled me up. But I realized my thinking was out to lunch, man. It was twisted. I was under the influence of a stronghold, you know, of false reasoning. Where it also is vain imaginations or deceptive fantasies. We have teachings in recovery that they're called fantasy thinking. We know the prodigal son, you know, had all this loftiness in his head, didn't he? Thinking he was all that. Arrogantly went to his father and demanded that he give him the inheritance. And, uh, you know, if you really study that, he, the inheritance that he was getting was was a quick inheritance. That means it was it was liquidated based on what it was worth there, not its future. So basically, he just got he just got dimes dimes on the dollar, and he took that and went out and spent it on loose living and po- became impoverished. And you know, then all of a sudden one day in a pig pen, he came into reality. Did and he says he said the word says he came to his senses. He came to good reason. He wasn't miscalculating. He wasn't reasoning falsely. He wasn't being deceived. He wasn't being deluded. He, he didn't have illogical, irrational thinking. He came to a moment of clarity to, to have a right mind. He was in right mind, in the sound mind. That's what we're going to talk about here in a few weeks too. So he went from fantasy to back to reality and came back home and hopefully he had to go to work on dealing with all that sting and thinking, didn't he? How I many know uh, the devil loves to get us up in fantasy. We call it daydreaming sometimes. The devil loves for you to start thinking about your past and oh how I blew it, oh how I messed up and you know, get you dwelling on all those negative things of the past. Then he loves to get you out in the future too fantasize to go about oh you know, next thing we know we, we're living, you know, and we've been daydreaming. People say, where are you headed? Where, where are you at? Where, 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 where's your head at? And you realize, man, you're not even focused on what's going on in front of you. You're, you're, you're up here in your head in fantasy thinking, and you're not even engaged. And I got called on that a lot at Dublin, too. Hey, hey, where you at? Where you at? Where you at? Right here, right here. This is where we're at. This is what you need to focus on. This is what you need to be doing. The devil doesn't want you in the now because that's the only place God lives. If it happened in the past and the future with fantasy thinking. So he loves to get you up in your head fantasizing all the time in vain. Main means useless, worthless, pointless imaginations. So we have to get in reality. We have to think about what we're thinking about. We have to recognize the stinking thinking. And the next one is what we call human reasonings. It's independent thinking. Independent human reasoning is, is reasoning that has no, there's no God in it. God's not included in, in you're not asking God any questions, you're not asking him what to think, you're, you're totally independent in your thinking. You're just running on your own. How I mean, you know the mind is a bad neighborhood? We don't want to be up in our mind alone. We want we don't never you don't you don't ever want to go up into your head without the Lord. That's like a bad neighbor. That's just crazy. You need to get out of there and get out fast. But the devil loves to get us up in our head. He loves us to begin to reason something out to a conclusion our own. And you know, we we love to deliberate or calculate. And to reason things out on our own. It's, it's, a, it's a stronghold. It's a habit. It's something we practice all of our life. I developed a serious stronghold. I call it a stronghold of the intellect. It came from sitting around smoking pot too much. Oh, wow, man. Wow, man. You just sit there and you just think. And you think. And you think. I mean, I really think this is part of the consequences of one of the things of, of my sin. You know, I'm, I'm a contemplator. Yeah, I like to I like to spend time meditating. I didn't used to be that way, but that's what I like to do now. And so it's my best asset, but it's also my worst one, isn't it? Because anything that's a good thing, the devil loves to twist it and pervert it. So that you know, there, there's been a what I call a stronghold of the intellect, where I, I like to just 
I don't realize that I run on my own. Next thing I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm rational. I'm minimal. I'm up in my head. I'm dwelling on it. I can't think. I'm overthinking it. Three o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting there still wide awake because it's so in my head. It's like a pink elephant in the room. I can't quit thinking about it. You're in your head. You can't function. How many you ever been up in your head here? And here someone's trying to talk to you, and they go, "Hello, hello, I'm here." And you're, you know, you're talking, but you ain't listening. You're, you're over here. <coughs> still in that confrontation that you just had. You're over here bouncing off walls and putting people in danger. I almost killed some people in the sawmill because I was so up in my head over a sociogram. Here I'm left a hammer and the, and the edger and two big old saw blades like that running and you know, could have killed some people. And uh, James 22 says to prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. The word delude means to miscalculate or reason falsely. When we don't act upon the things that God tells us and we close our ear to it, it says that we begin to, to delude ourselves. That means to deceive or to reason falsely, or miscalculate. I mean, if I'm trying to get somewhere and I calculate my wind speed and my amount of fuel and I'm trying to go somewhere, but I miscalculate, I'm not going to end up where I need to be, I'm not. And my best thinking got me here. I've misreasoned and miscalculated all my life, and I realized that you know I, I need to, you know, I need to, to turn my thinking over to the Lord. So we have this stronghold of human reason. I call the intellect. Some of you have seen this, but here I am in problem. <clears throat> Crisis. And immediately, my referring to myself, what I've had to learn to catch myself and correct is that I've had this stronghold of instead of going to God, I go straight over here. That's a head. I'll immediately go straight to my head, to my intellect, to my human region, and I'll begin to calculate, I'll bring through it, and you know, I'll, I'll uh, you know, just out of habit. There's no God in it. And then when I got it all figured out, then I go tell God what we're going to do. Hi, Lord, this is what this is what I think, this is what I feel. The Lord says, I don't care what you think, I don't care what you feel. Isn't that the kind of thinking? And that, that isn't that the way you've done business? Isn't that the stronghold that's got you in so much trouble? So what we've got to learn to do is we've got to reverse that process. The first thing I need to do is problem, problem. Been here before. I don't trust my thinking, I don't trust my judgment. I don't need to get on the phone and call the preacher right away. I don't need to call a counselor. I don't need to do all those things. First thing, I don't need to wonder around, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? I need to go to my prayer closet, and I need to go straight to God and say, God, what do you think? What do you feel? Ask for wisdom. He who needs wisdom, let him ask of God, and God will give it to you. I don't need my wisdom, or my intellect, my human. I need God's wisdom. I need His reason. That's why the Bible says, Isaiah says, come let us reason together. I love that. What God's basically telling, I guess it's Isaiah, is that where that's at? Yeah. Is we're friends now. We have a relationship. You don't need to reason everything out. Let's do it together. I love that. He includes him. He says, I want you to be included in this. I want you to learn. I want you to grow. But let's, let's reason correctly. Let's reason accurately. Let's not be illogical and irrational. Deluding and deceptive. Let's... Let's go talk to me about the problem. And then when we've got the answers, then I'll tell you how to handle the problem. So it's when I have a problem, instead of running straight to the problem to my own intellect and then going to the Lord, I need to go to the Lord and then let Him come to me. Wouldn't that be much better? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us to trust on the Lord with all our heart. 
Listen to this. Rely not on your own understanding. Wow. Your own intellect, your own human reason. Don't go with that stronghold. Trust in the Lord. Not in yourself, not in your own intellect, but trust in the Lord. Go straight to Him with all your heart. Lean not on your own intellect. In all your ways, acknowledge His assumed authority and then He will direct your paths. This is a tool that will help catch you. The next one is, and the last one is called obsessive thinking. How many of you have ever had obsessive? Possessive, possessive, obsessive, compulsive, inordinate, relentless, assault and a badgering, a bombardment of thoughts and things that just, just overwhelm you. How many of you ever sometimes get that way? You're so up in your head that it becomes painful. I hate to admit it, but I'm not near like I used to be. Improved a lot, but it's still, there's some times where for some reason the Lord, the devil knows just how to shoot a fiery dart. He knows how to get right between my armor. He knows how to put his finger on a particular issue or to push my buttons. Not because he's trying to be mean, but because he's trying to reveal the stronghold so that I can learn to deal with it. But for whatever reason, this is what we talk about, the fiery darts, the flaming arrows that hit our minds, that influence and put poison in our bed, our bodies that start in our head and we don't deal with them and they go down and they, they begin to put poison in our body and they begin to paralyze us. And that's what happens when you take a thought and you don't deal with it and the devil knows how to put that thought and you don't bring that thought captive. That thought is just sitting there like an arrow putting poison in your mind and it paralyzes you and you're in your head and you can't get out. Has anybody ever been like that or just me? I'm talking about where you literally physically get to this place in your head where you just can't seem to get out of it. You're being tortured mm -hmm. and tormented. You try to go walk and the devil's talking to you. You try to sleep, the devil's talking to you. And, and, you know, here in the name of Jesus, you're supposed to have victory on these things. And here the devil's just torturing you and harassing you. This is a revelation of, of a very deep, deep stronghold. It's called obsessive thinking. And the devil has you up in your head and, and the word is... You're dwelling. The word dwell is the word kind of like abide that means to take up permanent residence. It means to settle down or pitch a tent. What that really means is all of a sudden the devil wants to get in your head and you're not dealing with that thought, that stinking thinking, so all of a sudden he decides, oh, I think I'll make that home for the night. I'll pitch a tent. I'll just harass you all, all night long. I'll torture you all night long. I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll ruin your whole night. And and it's horrible. All in the name of Jesus. And we can't get out. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 talks about Paul's thorn. He says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation for this reason, because of to keep me from exalting myself, or keep me from having lofty things, to deal with that stronghold, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. To keep me from exalting myself, from having a worse problem with lofty thinking. The thorn, if you study that word, it wasn't just a splinter, it was actually more like an axe. In this case, we don't know why, but it, Paul had such a, a, a problem with being elevated, it's probably that, that God had to put some kind of <clears throat> harassing, ongoing thing or infirmity, not a sin, but an infirmity. It would cause him to be you know, constantly humble. Oh God, oh God, oh God. We think it was probably with him was massive headaches. He had these massive migraine headaches all the time. So he's probably constantly walking around in humility saying, Oh God, help me, help me, help me. I gotta preach and I, I got a headache. Lord, I gotta do this, I got a headache. And they were intense, they were like an axe. And they were harassing them and bombarding him. The word it says that they were sent there to torment me. It's actually a word means buff, and it means a violent word. It means to it means to, to hit somebody in a specific area until they're black and blue over and over again, to pummel them, 
Just clobber a specific area. Now Philippians 4 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good repute, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. So we're going to have to learn to change our stinking thinking. We're going to have to learn to set our minds on the things above. This is what we're going to talk about in the next few weeks about how to bring thoughts captive and deal with these things. So we are destroying speculations and lofty things and everything raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. So how are you doing against these lofty things and speculations? Now if you want to start dealing with these things, um, basically I gave you the tools last week about renewing your mind, using the DMI to identify these strongholds, journaling, confession, taking ownership, and prayer and fasting. So if you didn't get those handouts, then there's some over there, Damien will help you get them. If you do have them and you want to start dealing with these things, then it's the only way you're going to do is to get to work and start dealing with them. Amen? All right, Lord, we love you. We thank you. We appreciate you. Lord, let us more and more learn to recognize these lofty things and these speculations, Lord, and let us learn to catch ourselves and get out of that neighborhood and get out quick. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.